Good morning, everyone. It's, it's as I guess, if, if you haven't done this yet, um, you may go on to do this this afternoon. It's really abnormal to speak into a microphone that isn't actually projecting in a room where you don't need a microphone for the purposes of recording. But anyway, that's what we're doing. Um, welcome back to, to day two of this conference, Unsettling Communities. Um, it's day four of various um, sort of conference symposia activity that we've been doing. And, and likely the final day, I think, of this kind of activity, at least specifically around, around this topic. Um, uh, Godla yesterday gave a very comprehensive introduction to the work that we're doing. Um, I just want to say a few words this morning about what are some of the unusual aspects of the structure of today, um, whilst also welcoming you, welcoming, welcoming you all back. So, as you heard yesterday, as as you know from the call for papers, as you may know from the conference prior to this one. We've organized activity around this topic um, into three categories, those being mapping Europe, um, circulation and readership, and lastly, acts of unsettling. And all the conference section sessions are broken up into those three categories. Um, the rationale behind that was these seem to be the major issues at stake uh, in and around minor and minority writing in Europe. Um, and also, the secondary rationale is that we are planning on doing a publication or publication off the back of, of this work together. And the hope is that the publication or publications will be organized around those themes. So what that means for today is after the sort of standard panel sessions, which will run up until uh, about 3 o'clock, at the end of the day, as you'll see on the program, there are two things happening which may or may not be 100% clear that we just wanted to clarify. So the first is after tea at, at 3.15, there will be what's listed as acts of unsettling circulation readership and mapping Europe seminars. Um, what those are, um, are very uh, brief but thorough conversations around <laughs> those three headings. So there are various folks in the room, I don't know if it's worthwhile kind of just briefly identifying yourself, who have there you are, they're waving. <laughs> They've taken responsibility for, for one or more of these headings, and they will be meeting with anybody who is interested in the respective headings, so acts of unsettling, circulation readership, mapping Europe, um, to talk about the topic. So uh, one of the major goals of, of, of this conference activity was uniting colleagues who otherwise wouldn't necessarily get together, who work in fields which are distinct, um, in subfields of literary studies, post-colonial studies, area studies, comparative literature, who may or may not ever interact. Um, and one of the joys of this conference is the way that knowledge has been exchanged sort of across these perhaps slightly artificial borderlines between these sub-disciplines. The hope of these very quick 30-minute discussions is firstly to have the opportunity as colleagues to talk about these issues in a, in a looser and less structured kind of way, um, the joy that our students have all the time but we often don't get. Um, and then also to, where possible, sort of distill the ideas that are circulating. Um, all of us, based on our, our distinct areas of study, will have particular insights into these topics that other colleagues may not have. So it's an opportunity really to exchange ideas and perhaps uh, do some preliminary synthesis, which then in the final session, which starts at 4.30, the round table discussion, um, will attempt to uh, push even further. So that final conversation um, in here will feature the people who are leading those seminar discussions. It'll be a round table, um, uh, talk about you know, what's happened in those conversations other issues, and then we'll open it up to the room. Um, so it is the case often, I think, at conferences that we leave thinking, oh, I wish I had said a little bit more about this thing, or that was really interesting, but we didn't have the opportunity to develop it, or I never spoke to such and such. And, and the goal really for that final hour of the conference is to make it so you leave this conference not with all of those lingering thoughts, um, but with a sense of satisfaction of having discussed all the things that you wanted to discuss, maybe. Um, so that's what it's all about. Um, so uh, uh, yeah, we, we, we're, it would be really, really fantastic. Um, if it goes the way we imagined it, it, it will go. Um, and the thing that that hinges on is really the active participation of everyone present. So we're very, 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 very much looking forward to, to talking to you all in those uh, little spaces a bit later on. So that's it. Welcome back.
So yes, welcome back and um, to our first panel for, um, for today. And, and it's a great pleasure to introduce Stefan Villa from the Centre for Literary and Cultural Research in Berlin. And Stefan is also Professor of Cultural Studies at the Humboldt University in Berlin, with a particular focus on the history of thought. Um, uh, I don't know where to start with telling you about his wide-ranging research interests, but just to mention some of his book publications, uh, he has books on the, f um, on the concept of heritage um, and cultural transmission, on the concept of generation, uh, on the poetics of etymology and German romanticism, and, um, uh, but also on um, knowledge of the future in science, religion and the arts, and on the cultural history of music. So a, a, a wonderfully um, uh, wide-ranging set of interests. Um, today, he's coming closer to his North German roots, <laughs> uh, perhaps, um, in, with a paper on the promotion of low German, as a North, uh, North German uh, Plattdeutsch literature, um, so a form of dialect literature. And um, so we're talking, so he's going to be talking about a, a small literature, its promotion, its institutional promotion, and its representational function. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to hearing this. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Good morning. Um, yeah, I will deal with a small literature in Germany, the Low German literature. Low German uh, used to be spoken all over Northern Germany, actually, in numerous varieties. Nowadays, it's among those European languages uh, which, according to the European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages, require specific protection and promotion. So just a few words. Uh, to introduce this language. It's in fact considered to be a language, not a dialect. So accordingly, there are two German languages in the German-speaking area. It's a very rough map. High German, north of the red line, Hochdeutsch, uh, so, sorry, south of the red line, and Low German, Niederdeutsch, north of the red line. That's, well, what it used to be, maybe. Both languages, High German and Low German, differ phonologically and grammatically, also lexically, but to a lesser extent. Uh, High German, again, can be divided into Middle German and Upper German. Um, so Low and High are geographical terms, and so are Middle and Upper. Low German is the language spoken in the lowlands, and High German is the language spoken in the highlands. Uh, Middle German belonging to the secondary mountain region and Upper German to the high altitude mountain region. So that's why it's called Low, High, Middle, Upper. The High German word for Low German is Niederdeutsch or Plattdeutsch. And in Low German itself it is called Niederdeutsch, Plattdeutsch or simply Platt. Platt not only means low but also plain or even so the notion plat has been and is being used for something like plain speech. So along with the geographical distinction of high and low come stylistic and social implications. It's important to know that low German used to be a language of government and of poetry in the Middle Ages, well into the 16th century. But ever since, um, since early modernism, the German administrative and literary idiom developed not from low but from high German. And this development led to a progressive degradation of low German, but even as an unofficial private and colloquial idiom, it continued to be the native language of North Germans over centuries. As such, it could be claimed and reactivated time and again as a literary language, most successfully in 19th century romanticism and realism. This situation changed again when in the second half of the 20th century, Low German rapidly decreased also as a spoken language due to a complex mixture of social, political, educational and medial factors. With less and less native speakers, Low German even seemed to be bound to become extinct. However, over the last decades, attempts have been made to safeguard and revive it precisely by using education and media as instruments of language policy. So in what follows, I'm going to examine to which extent these factors have stimulated Low German as a literary language once more. 
First, I will discuss some of the more general interrelations between institutional factors and cultural productivity. Second, I will present a couple of recent examples of low German literature in which its regional or minority status as such is at stake, leading to phenomena of multilingualism and hybridity. In my abstract, I mentioned Crusoe by Lutz Seiler, but I'm not going to talk about this. Not so, uh, there's not so much plot in it. I'm going to mention something else. And these phenomena are interesting because they raise the question what can be called Nordish, Nordish by nature. And this is the title of a low German hip hop song by the band Fettes Brot, to which I will come back at the end of this talk. As for the institutional aspect, mm, let me begin with a personal reminiscence. I was born in 1970 in Bremen, a city-state roughly 100 kilometers from Hamburg and 50 kilometers from the North Sea, and thus north by any definition. But when I grew up there in the 1970s, no one I knew spoke low German, neither relatives nor neighbors. Already my parents, born around 1940, were native high German speakers. Among my grandparents, just one grandfather was raised in low German, but he died when I was one year old. And his parents, as I was told by my mother, had been Platyuc speakers for all of their lives. They lived in the countryside and used High German only as a more or less formal language, but these great-grandparents of mine were already dead when I was born. So there was no native Low German around, just sporadic words or phrases that I certainly heard as a small child. Anyway, my first actual first contact with Low German as a distinct language took place in the educational context, in a facultative club that I attended in primary school, and it was run by a dedicated teacher. It was there that I came across the classical Low German canon, poems and folkloristic songs, mainly from the late 18th through early 20th centuries. Beautiful pieces like this anonymous poem. Dat du min leifsten bist, dat du wohl weist. Kum bi de nacht, kum bi de nacht, sech wo du heist. Kum bi de nacht, kum bi de nacht, sech wo du heist. Actually, of course, needs to be sung. I'm just reading it to you so you have something in your ears. <laughs> kum du um Mitternacht, kum du Glock ein. Vater slept, Mutter slept, ich slap allein. Vater slept, Mutter slept, ich slap allein. In high German it would be Vater schläft, Mutter schläft, ich schlaf allein. Yes, that's the quite distinct uh, phonetics and phonology of Platt compared to high German. Besides songs and poems in that school club, there was also theater. Once a year we rehearsed a short play and performed it at some school festivity. I recall an episode of Till Eulenspiegel, Till Uhlenspiegel, a popular German trickster figure, and in fact the hero of a low German tale from around 1500, but which I didn't know then. And I remember playing the leading part as Ochen Aldach in a short dramatic excerpt from the eponymous low German Bildungsroman written by Georg Droste from 1913 to 1917. So the literary canon was more or less classical, but the didactic approach at that school club was quite advanced. advanced. What was brought into play here were local studies actually integrating history, literature, and cultural practice. Moreover, our teacher encouraged us to participate in a low German reading contest that had just been initiated in the mid-1970s. It was organized by the Bremen Institute of Low German Language, a newly founded research institution back then that continues to exist today. <coughs> the prizes for the competition were being promised by the Bremen Mutual Savings Bank. Back then it didn't occur to me that this collaboration between the Institute for Low German and the Mutual Savings Bank was actually quite original. I simply found it rewarding because over the years I repeatedly won that contest and every time gained 150 marks or so. And in fact, the German mutual savings banks, the Sparkassen, have an official commitment to support culture and education. But anyway, it was a clever move by the then brand new Institute of Low German Language to create this kind of 
outreach of their academic work with hundreds of young students joining the competition year after year. As for the choice of texts we were reading, the organizers did not simply rely on the resourcefulness of students or school teachers, but offered folders with collected reading material, so I got to know another part of the Low German canon, short tales, stories and parables, some historical, some slightly modernistic in the making, some quite serious, but for the most part humorous or satirical. And as for the more recent ones, many of their authors could be heard in a radio program quite famous in the north. It was called Hermann Beten Toe, listened in for a while, in the North German public broadcasting service and still being aired today. So in my low German education, facultative and informal though it was, there were several institutions involved. The state school, with recently developed local studies as subject of instruction. A research institute, where low German language and literature were being studied. The public radio, that delivered parts of the literary canon. And finally, a public-private bank for the funding. As I said, this institutional mix was kind of experimental at the time, but it was also symptomatic as similar activities started rising in several places during the 1970s and 80s in the large cities, but also in smaller towns all over northern Germany. In 1992, the European Council passed the European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages. Germany joined that charter in 1999, and from that point on, the following languages have been protected as minority languages in Germany. Danish, Frisian, Sorbian, Romani, and Low German. Romani is an Indo-Aryan language. Sorbian belongs to the Slavic languages, spoken in a some part in the southeast of Germany, very small community. Frisian in the north is West Germanic, related to Dutch, but it's not part of German. Danish is spoken in the very north on the German-Danish border, so there's only one German language on that protection list, and that's Low German. Strictly speaking, it's not a minority language, but a regional language. However, in the European charter for regional or minority languages, the point is precisely not to draw that neat distinction between minor and regional, but to combine minority and regional languages in the same program of language policy. By definition, in the first article of that charter, regional or minority languages means languages that are one, traditionally used within a given territory of a state by nationals of that state who form a group numerically smaller than the rest of the state's population. And two, different languages that are different from the official language or languages of that state. So you see that in this definition, minority and regionality are closely connected. The community or group as such is understood to be a situated, located entity. It belongs to a territory. To be sure, also non-territorial languages are being considered in the Charter, and that would be the case with the Romani uh, language in, in Germany. The general objective of this convention is the recognition of the regional or minority languages as an expression of cultural wealth. And for this purpose, the parties, the states that are part of this convention, the parties undertake to eliminate any unjustified distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference relating to the use of a regional or minority language. In the main part of the Charter, a large set of measures is presented to translate these objectives and principles into action in branches such as education, um, judicial authorities, public service, media, cultural activities, 
economic and social life and also transfrontier exchanges. As is the case with many of these charters and conventions from international organizations such as the European Council or the UNESCO, there are all kinds of national and regional corporations that somehow deal with matters of um, implementation. For Low German, there is a council called the Bundesrat für Niederdeutsch, Federal Council for Low German, which is an advisory board which, with delegates from all of the German federal states, the Bundesländer, which count as Low German regions, either partly or completely. And by the way, that's eight out of 16 federal states. These Advisors are not politicians, but they are experts and representatives of the civil society. <coughs> so incidentally, the aforementioned Bremen Institute of Low German Language plays an important part in that Federal Council for Low German, whose self-declared task is to represent the interests of Low German speakers and to foster the consideration of Low German in public life. And that's just a screenshot from the website of that Bundesrat for Niederdeutsch. They publish books and brochures on the role of low German in schools and media. And they also published in 2014 a report which re-evaluated uh, re the state of affairs after 15 years of low German as an officially protected language. It's important to know that when ratifying the language <coughs> charter, a state does not have to commit to it entirely, but can choose from a menu of more or less strict obligations. And given Germany's federal structure, this leads to a rather complicated situation with different commitments made by the various federal states. The report, this report, enlists these commitments in detail and compares them with their realizations. For the subject of literature, it is especially relevant what the report has to say about the measures taken in education, media, and culture. The self-obligations of many of the federal states had been quite far-reaching in 1999, when the uh, convention, the charter, was being ratified. but the state in 2014 reads quite sobering. Here and there progress has been made. For instance, Low German has become a regular subject of instruction in all primary schools in the city-state of Hamburg. But altogether, according to that report, the educational, medial and cultural implementation seems to be going on rather carelessly. Radio and TV stations, both public and private, lack coherent strategies for Low German programs. Journalists and public relation experts are not trained in low German language and culture. And although Article 12 of the Charter about cultural activities and facilities states that types of expression and access to works produced in regional or minority languages should be supported, for instance, by financing translations or by integrating minority languages into cultural policy abroad. The official attempts, according to the report, are, being, uh, are by far dissatisfactory. So what does that mean? One could have the impression that the officials have almost completely failed. One might also think that the European Charter as such was a failure, since it tried to implement rather lofty aims by unsuitable measures. Or one might suspect that an advisory board such as the Bundesrat für Niederdeutsch is generally mistaken when it just keeps pondering over charters, guidelines and rules for implementation that do not depict what's going on outside in the real life processes of regional language culture. All of this may be true to a certain extent, but I think the political promotion of regional and minority languages is not a bad thing. Neither is the continuing challenge of official language policies by representatives of the civil society. Moreover, there can hardly be any doubt that ever since Low German has been officially labeled and listed among uh, the regional and minority languages, this very enlistment has had its effects, not only on official or semi-official language policies, but also on individual language attitudes. 
the idea of plot not being a phenomenon of the cultural past, but an integral part of Europe's linguistic diversity is actually quite appealing and has encouraged local and peripheral initiatives. So today there are all kinds of registered and unregistered societies and associations which foster low German language, culture and literature. There are publishing houses, Schünemann in Bremen, Quickborn in Hamburg or Hinsdorf in Rostock producing low German books and media. There is, for instance, the Förplatt Society. There are websites like Plattnet or Plattdeutschnet. There are literary awards like the well-established Quickborn Preis or the more recent Fritz Reuter Literatur Preis, named after the 19th century author who established low German as a language for the realistic novel. There are band contests like Platt Sounds and Platt is Cool, or as someone stated, Platt is not uncool. <laughs> <laughs> and there is, uh, for instance, the biennial Platt Art Festival for New Low German Culture. The self declarations of these initiatives shift between careful safeguarding and cheerful pragmatism or one might also say between rhetorics of survival and of vitalism. On the one hand, there are double negative or defensive statements like low German may not be abandoned, it must not die, it's high time we did something to maintain it. On the other hand, there are outright declarations doing away with defensiveness, like this one written by the author and presenter Annie Heger to promote the next Platt Art Festival, which will take, will take place in, in and around Oldenburg in just a few days' time. I read the English version first and then the Platt version. Our motto, we can do it, that's Angela Merkel, of course, so obviously, quote, we low Germans don't just say so, we also mean it. We sort things out. We are sick and tired of people <coughs> who always say that Platt is about to die. Our language is more than alive. It is colorful, exciting, constantly developing. Platt has so much to say, and yet you can best keep silent in Platt. I don't know if that's a good translation. I did it myself. Yes, our language is, is as brightly colored as the rainbow, a bunch of flowers, and the people speaking Platt. We make our language live, for we are also different. Unser Motto, wie kriegt das hin? Wie plattdeutschen, wie sagen das nicht bloß so, wie meint das auch? Wie packen an? Wie sind das leid und das verdrückt aus, dass die Leute immer bloß über das Starven von Platz nackt? Usprach ist mehr als lebendig. Sie ist bunt, obregend, entwickelt sich immer wieder. Platt hat so viel zu sagen und doch kann es auch platt auch am besten zwiegen. Ja, Usprach ist so kakelbunt als die Regenbuch in Blumenstruß und in Menschen, die Platz nacken, broten oder küren. So three different words for to speak. Uh, snacken is north. Low German, Proten is something more east, and Kühn is West Low German. So that's the diversity within this very verb. Ver ver very verb. We mocken us sprach lebendig, denn wir sind doch also verschieden. So it's quite interesting, actually. We Low Germans, the language, the land, and the people belonging together in one first person plural, the idea of a constant development. So the diachronic um, way of keeping something alive, of course, is development. And then there are several kinds of difference and diversity claims. The rainbow, um, the coloredness, we are also different. And incidentally, Annie Heger is uh, also a, a lesbian gay activist, so that's uh, somehow, is, that's, that's several diversity policies blended into one statement. And this emphasis on diversity and uh, activity brings me to the first of my literary examples. One of today's prolific low German authors, also an actor, presenter and singer, is Jaret Dibaba. He was born in 1969 in southwest Ethiopia, came to Germany first as a four-year-old child when his father studied at a German university 
and learn to speak high German by immersion in the kindergarten, etc. Then the family went back to Ethiopia, but then had to flee from the civil war, came to Germany again when Dibaba was, I think, 10 years old or so. And the family settled down in a small town in Lower Saxony where Low German was still much in use. As Jared Dibaba once explained in an interview, he soon became very fond of the language because it was regional, just like his mother tongue, Oromo. So as you can see, he's a media personality and he's playing with this idea of an Ethiopian being a North German. Yeah? So you have this Siemens choir and this guy up front. He has been a TV personality in regional programs which are broadcast in high German but with northern subjects and integrating low German interviews. He has also done some plot tutorials on YouTube, and I will show you one of these, where he simply recites the names of the weekdays in some kind of Sesame Street didactics. <laughs> and near the end of this uh, 40 seconds clip, he explains that the most important thing is not to say Samstag for Saturday, but to use the correct low German word Sonnabend, literally sun evening, so Sunday Eve. Moin zusammen und herzlich willkommen zu meiner plattdeutschen Serie Plattdeutsch für Anfänger. Jetzt geht es um die Wochentage. Die sind total wichtig, damit kann man richtig auftrumpfen hier bei uns im Norden. Die Woche fängt an mit Montag, Dienstag, Mittwoch oder Mittelweg. Dünnestag, Freda und jetzt kommt's. Auf keinen Fall Samstag sagen. Bitte nicht, das ist sowas von unnorddeutsch. Man sagt Sündabend und dann kommt Sündabend. Dann ist der Weg dort. Fertig. Markt die das, merkt euch das. Sündabend, nicht Samstag. <laughs> As a low German author, uh, Jared Di Baba has been contributing to the aforementioned Hörmal Beten Toe series for years and has collected his short texts into several books. The most recent one from 2016 has the programmatic title Unna Wegens, On the Way. And some of these texts are interventions into political debates. They deal with uh, stereotypical attitudes of the German majority towards others, strangers, refugees, people from elsewhere. And Di Baba's statements are in a way politically correct, but in fact they proceed as linguistic criticism. For instance, he criticizes the common word Flüchtling, refugee, not for being incorrect, but for being imprecise, since it does not refer to the reasons why people are inner vegans on their ways. Instead, he says we should call them displaced persons, verdrevene. In another text, he picks up stereotypes against people from the South, the European South or Global South, and then he tries to turn the cliches against themselves with the apparently naive question where the South actually begins. He tries the South of Hamburg, then the South of Germany, and then asks about his own status as a Southerner. Am I a southerner? Go ahead and tell a South African that Dibaba from Oromia and Ethiopia is a southerner, that he comes from the south. Well, that doesn't fit. Are you a southerner when you have black hair? Then I'm definitely not a southerner. I don't have hair. <laughs> but I do have a sailor sweater and a raincoat, and I like to talk plat, so I am definitely a northerner. Bin ich ein Südländer? Vertell mal ein Südafrikaner, der die Baba und Oromia in Äthiopien ist ein Südländer. Hier kommt und den Süden. Tja, nur passt das denn auch nicht. Bist du Südländer, wenn du bloß zwarte Hoher hast? Dann bin ich definitiv kein Südländer. Ich hef kein Hoher. Dafür habe ich einen Seemannspulli und einen Fräsennerz und schnack gern platt. Also bin ich definitiv Nordländer. With twists like these, belonging is Dibaba's favorite subject. One of Us is the title of an essay about the famous German pop singer Udo Lindenberg. As Dibaba mentions, Lindenberg is often taken to be from Hamburg or from the North Sea shore, but was in fact born in Gronau near the German-Dutch border. Dibaba ironically calls this the singer's migration background. And he adds that some of Udo Lindenberg's ancestors even came from the Indonesian 
Molucca Islands, former Dutch colony, and then concludes Moluccas, the Netherlands, Gronau, Hamburg, I told you, Udo Lindenberg, he's one of us. Molucken, Holland, Gronau, Hamburg, ich sag doch, Udo Lindenberg, that is ain't von uns. The general finding that all of us have been others and continue to be others, depending on the context, may seem somewhat trivial, and it probably would be trivial in a high German text. In low German, instead, the concept of belonging needs and deserves this kind of reflection because it has traditionally been treated in a purely affirmative way. And to a certain extent, Di Baba even remains part of that same tradition, for whenever he is preoccupied with the low German language as such, his approach is rather puristic especially when he argues against the use of anglicism, which, which he does quite often. So in Jared Di Baba's texts, the naturalness or nativeness of Low German is at the same time questioned and affirmed. He uses his own biography as an argument against the myth of the autochthonous essence of language, speakers and territory, but still he seems to indicate that Low German is somehow appropriate for the North, for the land and for the people. But his concept of communality and territoriality is certainly inclusive. It rests on encounters and on learning. Given his own experience with learning High and Low German, <coughs> he aims at the immersion into language to obtain something like a native enculturation or an enculturated nativeness. I'm uh, moving forward to my second example. One of the great literary successes of the last couple of years in Germany was Dörte Hansen's novel Altes Land, published in 2015. Altes Land is the name of a marshland on the Elbe riverside near Hamburg. It's an important cultural landscape interesting for a certain technique of land reclamation and of fruit production, moreover for the ancient rural frame houses. Dörte Hansen situates her novel in one of these houses. This is the setting for a multi-generational story focusing on two female figures. One is Vera, who has been living in this place ever since she came here as a small girl after the Second World War fleeing with her mother from East Prussia. The other is Anne, Vera's niece, who comes to live with her aunt after splitting up with her husband. Both the story of the women getting together and Vera's preceding life story are constantly intertwined, and so are the general narratives of flight and displacement. Vera's post-war situation and Anne's private unhappiness. This does not mean that the obvious historical differences are leveled, but nonetheless the, novels, the novel suggests certain parallels of female destinies and of coping with them. This book, to be sure, was written in high German. Otherwise it wouldn't have sold tens of thousands of copies. But there is a relevant number of low German phrases in the text, starting on the very first page with a description of the house on the gable there is an inscription which says, Did hus is mean und doch nicht mean, den Nomi kommt, nennt auch noch sie. I think this is actually quite common, something like this, yeah? Claiming this is mine, but it won't continue to be mine, for after I'm dead, it will be passed on to someone else and it will be his. And this chronotopical motto, which turns out to be a leitmotiv in the novel, is said to be the first low German phrase that the little displaced person Vera had learned. The second one, still on the first page of the novel, is the aggressive question raised by the landlady when this displaced girl with her mother arrives on that Altes Landhof. Wo viel kommt denn noch von Jo Polacken? How many of your Polacks are going to follow? And these two initial, initial low German phrases are followed by many others throughout the novel, especially in those parts where Vera's life story is narrated, which is plausible since in the 1950s, 60s and 70s there were many native speakers remaining in the countryside. 
Interestingly, however, Low German is also used within the present setting, which often deals with the countryside fashion among townspeople, resulting in certain acts of taking over. There's one particularly narcissistic character who comes to the Altes Land from Hamburg, just like Anne, but for different reasons, namely to write books on the country life and articles for slow food magazines. He loves to be photographed in rural clothing by his fellow journalists and is fond of his own authentic appearance. Er streute kleine plattdeutsche Brocken in seine Sätze. Er sagte, kick mal an, or, oder dat sech man. That's one expression of slight surprise and another of affirmation. Kick mal an, oder dat sech man. Und zum Abschied rief er kurz und kernig, seto. Kind of, tschüss. A high German reader can easily understand these short expressions and exclamations from their contexts. They do not affect the readability of the high German text, although I think the novel sold better in the northern parts of Germany than in the, th in, than in the south. However, there exists a version with a bigger share of low German, and that's a radio play which was co-produced last year by two public broadcasting stations, Radio Bremen and the Northern German Broadcasting. And the genre of the radio play is a very important part of low German literary life, with regular productions being broadcasted on an almost weekly basis. The audio play version of Altes Land was written and directed by Wolfgang Seesko, and here's the passage from the very beginning with the gable inscription. We have a narrator and two female voices. Die Inschrift am Giebel war verwittert. Der Gruß ist nie und doch nicht nie. Und doch nicht nie. Der Normi kommt mit Ob noch sehen. Es war der erste plattdeutsche Satz, den Vera gelernt hatte, als sie an der Hand ihrer Mutter auf diesen Altländerhof gekommen war. Woher kommt der noch von Jokolang? Altes Land. Wir spielen nach Motiven des gleichnamigen Romans von Dr. Hansen. Both languages, High German and Low German, are often being intertwined, like in the following passage, which is about the constant fight between Vera's mother and the landlady. It is described by the narrator while we hear the women uh, shouting at, at each other. Sie lieferten sich schwere Schlachten in diesem Haus, das Ida nicht hergeben und Hildegard nicht mehr verlassen wollte. Die jahrelange Schreierei, die Fünche, das Türenknallen, das Krachen der Kristallrasen und Goldwandtassen zogen in die Ritzen der Hände, setzten sich wie Staub auf Dielenbrettern und Deckenbalken ab. Es hatte sich herumgesprochen, dass bei Eckhoffs ziemlich oft die Wände wackelten. Okay, we can leave it at that. How am I doing with time? We started a little later, I think. But can I go on for? Uh, okay. So the technical skills of the radio play are being used to stage phenomena of language contact and of diglossia. Incidentally, Dörte Hansen herself is not only bilingual but she is also a trained linguist who wrote her PhD dissertation back in the 1990s on phenomena of language contact in Low German. According to this uh, thesis, the differences between the two German languages are to a certain extent leveled in bilingual speakers. As for grammar and lexis, these speakers tend to speak Low German like High German, practicing linguistic parallel connections. I think that's the the term, parallel connections. And one might even say that, ironically, those that grew up speaking Low German often seem to be least capable of recognizing it as a genuine language and instead turn it into a pseudo-dialect, as has been described by linguists. So diglossia produces interesting effects of hybridity and impurity that are sometimes understood as a threat to linguistic purity. And this is not so much a problem for the standard language, which will always be robust enough to cope with such effects, but it is often condemned by the advocates of minority original language, 
because they insist that the task of minority or regional literature and culture more generally is to partake in the project of safeguarding that language. Minor literature in this sense has to represent, to rebuild and to reshape a linguistic community that is understood to be under threat. So the argument can be raised and is being raised that minority and regional literatures should be as pure as possible in order to fulfill the imperative of safeguarding. This is why regionalism and provincialism continue to be promoted in Low German, as they are in many other small literatures. As for the broader literary market, the pure Low German literature does not appear there at all. It is hardly ever translated into High German or other languages. On the other hand, the examples that I have introduced seem to open up a different set of arguments in the debate about regional and minority literature. They do so in their respective ways of using Low German, in rearrangements of self and other, in effects of language shift and linguistic migration, in crossover phenomena between German and other languages that question the nativeness and naturalness of the regional language in its very ties to the territory and to the people. Speaking of which, I come to my last example as an epilogue, the hip-hop song Nordish by Nature, which I have announced in the title of my talk. And I don't know, do you all have the copies, the photocopies? Yeah. Um, the song was recorded by the hip-hop trio Fettes Brot, Fat Bread, in 1995. The three performers going by the stage names Schiffmeister, Dr. Renz and König Boris were quite young back then, they still perform today. The song title Nordish by Nature alludes to the 1990s US hip-hop duo Naughty by Nature. <laughs> and that's just one of the many jokes and allusions. I can't comment on all of them, but we'll just give you a few clues before playing that song and then that's it. So it's a so-called posse cut. It's verses done by the band itself and then by friends, uh, other hip-hop artists. Uh, there's a maxi version with many, many verses uh, done in the end in, in Danish and Dutch as well. So it's about an international north, actually. In the, in the single version, it's just uh, the verses that you have on your sheets. Verses one and four are actually low German. Verses three and five are high German. And the second verse is Missing, which is a mixture between High German and Low German spoken in cities like Hamburg or Bremen. So it's actually, when you hear it, you, it's, it's, it's a kind of colored High German with some Low German expressions. The text deals with Low German language and with culture. It's a celebration of the North, north especially of the city of Hamburg. And as usual in hip hop, the song thematizes itself. It's a constant boasting of the performers, but as always with this band, it's in a witty and self-ironic manner. As for Low German language, it's about its being inclusive and exclusive. As it says in the first verse, Bist nicht uten Norden ist das schwer zu verstehen. Da schnackt man nun mal so. When you're not from the north, you won't understand it, but that's how we talk, which, as I said, isn't true. Um, there are allusions to Störtebeker in the first and last verse as a famous pirate, uh, northern identificatory figure. Dance op de Deel, that would be uh, a rural festivity, and that's the way in which the disco sound is brought to the north. There's a greeting formula in the first verse, Hummel, Hummel, Moors, Moors, that's the Hamburg classical greeting. Um, and a very funny thing, you will hear it as well, in the third verse, and that's when two friends of that band, Der Tobi and Das Bo, come into play, um, they start doing it in, north, in, in High German, but then they shift to English, but pronounced in a very German way. Hello, peoples, we are here. Um, and then they go for Nachtfieber, Nachtfieber, which is night fever, uh, classical uh, disco sound. So it's a very funny thing. No, that was wrong. And Okay. Sorry. Yeah. 
It's three and a half minutes. And that's it.